we should be entering. Okay, so I think we are live. So, bem-vindo, todas as pessoas aqui presentes para o seminário do, do Observatório do Valongo. É, é, temos a, o grande prazer de receber a Wendy Friedman. É, eu vou continuar agora em inglês para ela também estar é, informada do que eu estou falando. <laughs> so, we have the great pleasure of having Wendy Friedman uh, here as part of our, our a series of Colloquia at Observatorio de Valongo. And I, I have to say, Wendy, we, we would describe uh, Wendy, I think, as having a stellar trajectory, but uh, it would be more of a cosmological tra trajectory, not so much stellar. But, um, but she, she's one of these amazing women in astronomy uh, that uh, has served as great inspiration for many of us. And I was very, very happy to, to, to to be able when she when she said that she she could come and, and give a virtual talk unfortunately we cannot receive her physically here in rio but we will in the future uh so just to introduce you uh, to introduce wendy to you all uh so she did a phd in astronomy astrophysics at the university of toronto uh she's canadian uh she uh, she did uh she took a, a carnegie fellowship uh, after her phd and she pretty quickly became a permanent uh, faculty uh, at that, uh, the Carnegie Institute uh, for Science uh, in, in Pasadena, California. And she was director uh, of that institute for 12, uh, 12 years. Uh, and during uh, most of that part, she was actually also the founding chair of the board of directors uh, for the Giant Magellan Telescope, which is one of these extremely large telescopes that will mark uh, a new era uh, for observational astrophysics and cosmology. Uh, 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 already in, in, in progress in, in, in construction in Chile. Um, so she, she's one of the women that is in the National Academy of Sciences, which uh, now I think they have actually made an effort to, to, to be a bit more um, um, equal in terms of gender, but when Wendy entered, certainly it wasn't, it wasn't the case. Uh, she's also she has a lot of prices. I will not list them so that it that that it loses uh, the importance. But uh, she's also a legacy a fellow of the American Astronomical Society, and she was one of the co-recipients for the 2009 uh, Gruber Cosmology Prize. Uh, but she's a um, she's an amazing uh, uh, researcher with a, a a long list of papers, but. Uh, Let's not uh, dissuade us, and let's not think only about numbers, but also of quality. But uh, but I invite you to to look at uh, at her at her work. Since one of the most resounding works uh, is related to the Hubble Space Telescope Key Project, uh, where uh, Dr. Wendy Friedman, she is uh, a principal investigator. So it was a group of uh, about thirty astronomers uh, measuring the current expansion of the uh, expansion rate of the universe, and we'll actually hear. A little bit uh, more about that, and with uh, with that, I leave you guys and gals with uh, with Wendy. And please put all of your uh, questions; they can be in Portuguese or in English, and we'll bring them uh, to the discussion at the end of her talk. So, thank you very much, Wendy. I'm leaving you here uh, with your um, presentation. So, sorry, I clicked there. Okay, so now the floor is yours, Wendy. Oh, thank you very much, Kareem, for that very, very generous introduction. It's a pleasure for me to be speaking to you today. And I'm just going to check now that you can hear me okay, because I can't see anything. <laughs> yes, we can hear you well. Good. Okay. Well, um, it's a pleasure for me today to, to talk about some new work. In fact, I'm about to post a new paper on the archive in the next um, week or two. And uh, I've described to you a, a project that I've been working on for the last several years, which is trying to measure the value of the expansion rate of the universe, the local value, the Hubble constant, using a technique that is independent of the Cepheid distance scale. And as Quinn has mentioned, uh, I led this key project many, many years ago now, where we use Cepheid variables to calibrate a number of different methods for measuring distances beyond the Cepheids. And at that time when we started, the, the Hubble constant wasn't known to better than a factor of two, which was a pretty difficult situation for the field of cosmology to be in. 
and people argued about whether or not the Hubble constant was 50 or 100 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And we were able, for the first time with Hubble, to get above the atmosphere of the Earth where the problems due to crowding of images, individual Cepheids, against the background in which the Cepheids reside, we had sufficient resolution to measure the distances accurately to enough galaxies to move out into the Hubble flow. Uh, when, for example, we calibrated type 1a supernovae or other methods uh, at that, in use at the time. And we find ourselves now with another uh, debate over the value of the Hubble constant. And that has come about as a result of the fact that it's been possible with satellites like Planck and before that WMAP to measure the fluctuations in uh, the temperature and now the polarization of the cosmic microwave background to exquisite precision, to a thousandth of, of a percent of precision. And if you adopt what we now consider to be the standard model of cosmology, a model in which you have approximately one-third matter density, most of which is dark matter, and then about two-thirds uh, dark energy component. And then you can, uh, adopting that model, fit the power fluctuation spectrum, I'll show in a moment, and then infer the value of the local expansion rate today, the Hubble constant. And if the model is correct, then those two values, the ones that we measure locally and, and the one uh, using the cosmic microwave background, would, would match. And, and uh, recent work on Cepheid suggests that they don't match. And in fact, there is something like a 9% difference between the calibration that comes from Cepheid variables and what comes from the measurements of the fluctuations of the cosmic microwave background. And so this has given rise to what people are referring to as the Hubble constant tension. And the question before us, again, as it was uh, a few decades ago, do we have enough understanding of the systematic uncertainties in our measurements locally to be able to make this you know, rather extraordinary claim that the standard model is in, incorrect? So in other words, if the, um, the, you know, the measurements are correct, both measurements, the local measurements and the measurements of the cosmic microwave background, which is 380,000 years after the Big Bang, we could be learning something new about the physics of the early universe. So there is the possibility that both are correct and the standard model is incomplete. Now the results that I'm going to describe to you today, um, and we're getting increasing evidence that in fact uh, the standard model is holding up, that if we calibrate the local Hubble constant Rather than using Cepheids, if we use red giant branch stars, a method that's come to be known as the tip of the red giant branch, then in fact they're perfectly consistent with the uh, CMB results. And, and I think for me the exciting thing is there are a number of things on the horizon that I think are going to allow us to resolve unambiguously whether or not this tension is real, and that will come with future measurements with the Gaia satellite and also the upcoming James Webb Space Telescope. And so if we just broad brush, um, let me summarize what I've just said, the measurements of, of the early universe, when we refer to as early universe, fluctuations in the temperature and also polarization of the microwave background are leading to values of the Hubble constant of something like 67.4. And adopting that model, and it's just an assumption, that the model, you end up with a precision of less than 1%. So it's, it's a very tall order. You know, the, the bar has been placed very high by the microwave background uh, experiments. We're not there in the local universe. I will, I will preface my remarks by saying that there are a number of astrophysical effects and, and challenges measuring distances in the local universe that um, prevent us at the moment from reaching less than 1% precision. And I think if we're going to understand if these differences are real, those of us making the measurements locally really do have to improve the accuracy of our measurements. And, it, and that's a, a tall order. Now, if you take the measurements that uh, people have published and the quoted uncertainties, in some cases, those amount to more than five sigma tension. In some cases, six sigma, which would make it unambiguous that there is new fundamental physics that is required. 
and that uh, the, the evolution of the universe, something has happened um, that has uh, caused this difference between the early universe and today. So I just want to remind people and people who haven't thought about this subject for a while, um, showing here the value of measured value of the Hubble constant over year uh, over time of the year of publication. And starting with the early measurements of Hubble and others, and uh, Hubble's measurement in um, originally 1929 led to the discovery of the expansion of the universe. And he uh, obtained a value of about 500 kilometers per second per megaparsec. That was revised in the 1950s by Walter Botta, who discovered that there were two populations of Cepheids, and so the calibration uh, was off by about a factor of two. And then over time, the values settled into this realm where there was a, a difference of uh, a, a factor of two, a uh, difference between 50 and 100 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Um, and that was resolved at a level of 10% with the results from the, the key project, and I'll show those again in a moment. Now, this is a, a more recent version of the Hubble constant as a, a function of time, and what I'm showing here, so all these points in blue are from, does anybody see my cursor? No, if, if I move the cursor, can you see it? Well, I'm pointing to something, I don't know if you can see it, but yes. on the left. Yes, we can yes. see it. Okay, so on the left, I'm showing the value that came from the key project where we measured uh, Hubble constant of about 72 with an accuracy of 10%. And uh, the subsequent measurements, primarily by the SHOES team, also using Cepheid. So all of these measurements have for their calibration the distance scale based on the Cepheid Levitt law, period luminosity relation. This point, the CHP point, was uh, a group, the Carnegie Hubble. Uh, program group where we use the Spitzer mid-infrared space telescope to redetermine the zero point of the the, the Cepheid period luminosity relation using uh, the Large Magellanic Cloud, which we had used for the key project. And so these values have remained remarkably steady. If you use Cepheids, you're finding something in the low to mid 70s. Um, now, if we look at the the data coming from the microwave background and starting here with WMAP in 2003, those values uh, were in the low 70s early on, but they, as time went on and the data got more and more accurate and more of the sky had been covered and to higher sensitivity, and then with the Planck satellite here, more frequencies and higher uh, sensitivity and resolution, that value eventually settled at the 67.4 that I showed you earlier. This is a more recent measurement by the um, ACT and WMAP combined results that are giving a, a, a value very close to the Planck result, which decreases the systematic uncertainty in, in those measurements overall. I'm, I'm showing now the value that's obtained using the neutron star, neutron star binary object measurements by LIGO and then follow up uh, and with electromagnetic observations. I think a technique that's going to be very valuable in the future, but with a single object, the uncertainties right now are still very large. And um, they fell right in, in the middle, but uh, as you can see, the uncertainties are, are very large at the moment. And we hope that there'll be many more objects to come in the future. And so if you uh, look at uh, where the results have ended up, there's this divergence, and uh, depending on who is analyzing the data and how you interpret the uncertainties, it's anywhere from four to, in fact, now six sigma people are claiming difference. So if, and, and as I said, if this is real, um, this is indicating the exciting possibility that there's new physics that's missing from the, the standard model. Uh, showing. Now, the um, value that we got, uh, this is in 2019, when our group started to uh, publish our first results from a, a Hubble study of the tip of the red giant branch in nearby galaxies, and we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. And this last point here is, is a, a new analysis that, that I've, I've just completed, and uh, as I mentioned, we'll be posting shortly. So this value uh, that comes from the tip of the red giant branch is falling in the middle of uh, the the Cepheid and the CMB results, but uh, there is overlap uh, with the CMB results. But there's no indication from the tip of the red giant branch to within the uncertainties that there's a fundamental missing component in, 
in our um, understanding of the early universe. So <laughs> with the microwave background observations, because people are making measurements of temperature across the sky, you can describe uh, those temperature fluctuations in terms of spherical harmonics. Variance here is given by this parameter CL, and then DL is just the logarithmic version of that. So these are units of microkelvin uh, squared as a function of the multiple moment or scale. So you have decreasing scale going to the right. Um, here's the angular scale at the top. And this first peak in the fluctuation spectrum occurs at an angular scale of a, a degree, which is uh, reflecting the sound horizon at the surface of last scatter. And you can see now that uh, many, many peaks are visible, um, very well measured in this fluctuation spectrum. In fact, this is just the 2015 map, but already um, the, the measurements were exquisitely good. And the line here, which you can't see because it's such a good fit uh, in these middle peaks, is a fit to the lambda CDM model, the standard model of cosmology. And uh, here is, these are the data from 2018, the last publication of, of the Planck group. And uh, the, here are the temperature fluctuations, a six parameter fit to lambda CDM. And uh, here's the temperature TE correlations, uh, including also polarization and, and beautiful uh, fit to the lambda CDM model. So the Hubble constant is not one of those six parameters. It's a derived parameter given this model. And here is just a, a summary of, of the recent um, values that are coming from these various groups. So the Planck value here at 0.7% uh, precision quoted. The Cepheids are uh, now being quoted as under 2%. And this is the most recent value from the SHOES team based on calibration using the Gaia satellite for um, calibration of, of the Cepheid Levitt law. I won't get into the, um, the details of the um, Cepheid calibration using Gaia. I'm happy to answer questions um, if people have any following the talk. Uh, I mainly want to concentrate on, on the tip of the giant brand me measurements and uh, our value uh, that we originally published, this is based on a calibration using the Large Magellanic Cloud, which has become the standard for uh, both Cepheids and the tip of the red giant branch. And uh, as I mentioned, we came in just under 70. So between uh, the Cepheids and the, the CMB results. Now the there have recently been uh, some studies using gravitational lensing, strong gravitational lensing. And originally, they appeared to support the higher value of the Hubble constant, but there's been a, a recalibration and a recognition of how the modeling of the lens, the mass distribution of the lens, adds an additional uncertainty to the, um, to the measurement. And so the, the uh, more recent measurement by that group is coming out somewhere closer to the Planck value, but with a larger uh, uncertainty. And so that's uh, something that um, right now they, they need to understand the systematics uh, a little more. This is just a comparison now is a, the relative probability of density distributions of the CMB value and uh, our earlier tip of the giant branch um, um, method and you can see that uh, the uh, uncertainties overlap and if it were just the the uh, TRGB measurements we wouldn't be talking about attention at all and so we need to understand the difference between the TRGB and the Cepheids. Now uh, let me just uh, for a moment consider suppose the Cepheid results are correct and uh, in future, when we have more measurements that uh, can give us an unambiguous answer, we find that the local value is high and the CMB value remains low. How would we explain that difference? And people have looked into this very careful, carefully. A number of different possibilities have been um, looked into. One is that there could be an additional neutrino uh, say a sterile neutrino or some other form of uh, what people are referring to as dark radiation. And the difficulty here now turns out to be that the measured peaks in the CMB are so well determined that if you start doing something that changes the value of the Hubble constant, then it has an effect on these other peaks. 
And so that now gets ruled out. They're, they're, that's a very difficult thing uh, to do. And there are other um, constraints that come from bearing off, uh, uh, acoustic oscillations and, and other methods that, that make that now um, very unlikely. We don't yet know what the dark energy is. We have no fundamental uh, physical understanding of the dark energy. And so uh, perfectly reasonable to uh, ask whether or not the dark energy evolves a function of redshift. It's not simply uh, Einstein's cosmological constant with a value of W, which is the ratio of the pressure to the energy density. Uh, cosmological constant has a value of minus one. Uh, and again, the uh, now data coming from type 1a supernovae and baryon acoustic oscillations where you can measure the Hubble parameter as a function of redshift, uh, that, that does not fit. Uh, you have to have some very odd designer uh, W of Z to uh, explain the Hubble constant um, difference. And so um, that doesn't look promising at the moment. People have explored massive dark matter particles that might be decaying, modifying gravity, uh, giving up uh, a, a zero spatial curvature, non-Gaussian primordial fluctuations, and then and most recently a lot of attention has been paid to uh, very early universe physics. So before recombination, where you wouldn't have an effect on the later peaks, somehow you could add in, people have looked at uh, an additional scalar field that would uh, change the expansion rate, but then disappear right at the time of recombination so that you don't see its effect on the late time physics. Um, but that, you know, some people have described, requires not just one tooth fairy, but two tooth fairies, one to posit this um, additional scalar field and the other to have it magically disappear just when it would have some observable effect. Um, additional polarization data are going to allow more constraints, more um, tighter constraints on that possibility, but the models to date are able to get the value up to 70, but they don't actually, they're not able to get it up to 74. So at the current time, there's no uh, good theoretical explanation for why the Hubble constant, um, or how it could be that high, uh, and um, it's not to say that ultimately there won't be something that is found, but uh, it, it turns out to be very, very difficult to, to do. And because the constraints from so many other directions have gotten tighter, if you do something to change the Hubble constant, it's, it uh, comes out somewhere else. And, and, and if you try and explain, for example, there's also some tension um, in sigma 8 fluctuations on 8 megaparsec scales, but it has the opposite effect, change the Hubble constant, you make uh, uh, the sigma eight tension worse, not better. So it's difficult. And the difficulty in terms of the measurements is getting to uh, the issue of systematic errors. And, and it may seem obvious, um, but the distinction between precision, and we've been able to really improve the precision of these measurements. We have many more objects that we can bring down the statistical uncertainties in, in our distance measurements. But accuracy, that is being able to overcome the um, systematics, is something that has been a challenging issue for the distance scale for a very long time. And with the Planck measurements, having sub percent precision uh, under the assumption of uh, lambda CDM, we really need to be able to demonstrate that we have gotten our systematic errors under control at the level that would allow us to uh, claim this extraordinary uh, additional physics. So this is um, essentially now how the distance ladder is put together. It's a lot less complicated than it was than it was when we started the, the key project. There are many, many rungs of the distance ladder. But now we can calibrate the, the, the fundamental rung of the distance ladder by geometry, either trigonometric parallax in our own galaxy for Cepheids and red giant branch stars and other methods, uh, there is also the detached eclipsing binary method that can be applied to stars in our own galaxy as well as the Magellanic clouds. And then uh, there's a galaxy NGC 4258, which has a supermassive black hole and uh, water mega masers that are uh, orbiting the black hole. Uh, they're in a flat disk, uh, edge on disk, so that the geometry can be measured very accurately. And um, 
And so those are the um, methods that we use to do the fundamental zero point calibration. Then we step out into the realm of the Hubble Space Telescope, and that's where we measure Cepheids in galaxies that have had type 1a hosts, um, and they, which are uh, supernova 1a hosts. And so we can measure the distances to these galaxies, having calibrated them geometrically, and, uh, and, and step out into the nearby universe at, in the range of about 7 to 30 megaparsecs. And then that calibration can be applied to uh, distant supernovae, for example, which um, is the most accurate means we have now of measuring beyond the uh, red giants and the Cepheids. So we get out into the realm of 100 to 500 megaparsecs. Those galaxies are sufficiently far away that their motions, gravitationally induced motions, are a small fraction of the overall Hubble velocity. Um, it would be nice if we could stick to the Cepheids and to the Red Giant branch, but those stars, uh, those galaxies are too close. Uh, the, um, the peculiar motions induced are uh, a large fraction still of the Hubble uh, expansion. So let me move to Cepheids, and uh, it has remained the gold standard of measuring distances to galaxies, and I'll, I'll, I'll reaffirm that nearby, when you have ideal conditions, uh, then that is, stars are close enough that they're not crowded by other stars, and you can work out far enough in the disk that you're not uh, impacted by um, large differences in either chemical composition or, or dust. Um, they're, they're a superb uh, method for measuring the distance. And so you know, we recognized early on that you could uh, make use of multi-wavelength photometry. Here I'm showing uh, pure luminosity or Levitt laws for uh, large Magellanic Cloud and small Magellanic Cloud Cepheids going from the optical, uh, the B-band here at 4500 through to the near-infrared. This is J, H, and K, K being at 2.2 microns. And you can see that the dispersion in the period luminosity relation decreases as you go from the optical to the infrared. And that's simply a consequence of the fact that uh, the dependence of surface brightness on temperature decreases as you go to longer and longer wavelengths. So you can measure more accurate distances. The dispersion is smaller in, in the Levitt law at longer wavelengths. You have the additional uh, advantage that as you go to longer wavelengths, the effects of dust decrease and the effects of metallicity decrease. And so there's a real advantage. What you need still to do are discover the Cepheids, and the amplitudes are larger in the optical part of the spectrum. This is, uh, they're now light curves for Cepheids, a single Cepheid in our Milky Way as a function of, of wavelength. And so, so you want to discover the Cepheids where their amplitudes are, are large and they're unambiguously um, measured to have um, Cepheid-like light curves. And then you go to as far to the red as you can to, um, to counter the effects of, of dust and, and metallicity. So this is the uh, final result that came out of the key project where we calibrated these number of different methods including the type 1a supernovae, which you can see go out much farther than most of the methods. This is just the residuals uh, with respect to the uh, value that we found of 72. And uh, the smallest dispersion, they go out the farthest. So that's where most of the attention has been paid uh, in the subsequent years. And I'm just showing here the, the uh, probability density distributions for each of the methods that we calibrated. Uh, each of these has a unit area uh, uh, Gaussian here represents the statistical uncertainties uh, for each method, and the bars are indicating the, the systematic uncertainties. And so uh, we were able to overcome the, the factor of two uncertainty, and um, the largest systematic that remained was the distance to the large Magellanic Cloud, and that has improved significantly in the intervening couple of decades. This, these are measurements now from uh, the Spitzer uh, Mid-Infrared Telescope at 3.6 microns and uh, again versus log period and the points to the right are from the Large Magellanic Cloud and these points are from the Milky Way and calibrated using a group of us uh, that was led by Fritz Benedict and measured parallaxes, direct trigonometric parallaxes for these stars in the Milky Way. 
um, that allowed us to calibrate the distance to the large Magellanic cloud. And uh, for the key project, we used a distance of 18.5 that held up very well. I'll just point out that the dispersion in this relation is a uh, tenth of a magnitude. That's about 5% in distance for a single Cepheid. So in principle, if you had 100 Cepheids, you could measure a distance to better than 1%. Um, why haven't we been able to do that? Again, it's systematics and, um, and, and we still battle with, with those. But the distance to the LMC has um, really dramatically improved and 1% uh, distance has been measured by uh, Petrinsky and collaborators using detached eclipsing binaries. And uh, the agreement with what we find in the mid-infrared calibration uh, of the Levitt law uh, is spectacularly good. Now, uh, the Shoes Group has been measuring Cepheid distances to galaxies um, uh, in the nearby universe using HST. The, um, they measure, making these measurements in uh, the H-band at 1.6 microns. And you can see, relative to the Milky Way, uh, where the scatter is very low, even at the distance of M101, uh, Messier 101, it's only at 7 megaparsecs, the scatter goes up by about a factor of 4. NGC 4258, this is the uh, Maser galaxy I mentioned, also goes up by a factor of four. So we, th this, it's hard to measure Cepheids in, um, in more distant galaxies. You have to pay close attention to the fact that the Cepheids are located in the high surface brightness regions of, of spiral galaxies, and you have no choice. The Cepheids are young, and you find them in the disk. So um, that's just something you have to, to work um, with. Now, a uh, nice study uh, is uh, Javan Mardi et al. One of the um, worries that people have had is that the SHOES team alone has analyzed the results for these Cepheids in, in the SHOES project, and, um, and could there be some issues in the photometry? And so the first test case is the galaxy NGC 5584, and uh, you can see the Cepheids are uh, pretty uh, isolated here, doing photometry of these stars and the circles should not be a problem. It's only just an excess of 20 megaparsecs. It's not a galaxy where we'd expect to have a lot of pro problems. But once you push out to 20, 30, 40, I mean, so 30, 40, 50 megaparsecs, which is what the group is trying to do, that and into the central regions of the galaxy, um, then that becomes more problematic. This is a galaxy where we also measured the, um, so this is the, the recent all shoes value for the same galaxy good agreement and this is uh, what we published uh, in um, in our 2019 paper so uh, good agreement uh, amongst all of these uh, comparisons challenges remain at what level are metallicity effects an issue this is something that still is debated in the literature and uh, there's not a consensus on how large the metallicity effects are uh, stellar evolutionary effects, as we are pushing to understand uh, the calibration at, uh, we hope, eventually a goal of 1%, uh, although the SHOES team now is, um, they, they believe they've reached 1%, uh, there are evolutionary effects that could be uh, an issue. Stars cross the instability strip several times, they change their luminosities, and um, we don't know what part of their evolution the stars are in. The biggest issue is uh, that I think we need to pay attention to is whether or not there are uh, effects of blending as stars, the resolution decreases as you go to larger distances. How is that affecting your, your photometry? Are there systematic effects? This is the plot I showed you earlier where the dispersion in the Milky Way in the LMC is only a tenth of a magnitude, but by the time you get to seven megaparsecs, it's about a factor of four larger. And some of these distant galaxies you know, shown here at the same scale, um, they're, they're small and they're doing photometry is difficult and even finding Cepheids in the galaxy is difficult. This is a, an image in NGC 4258, the Maser galaxy. Here's an image in the optical, of one of the Cepheids uh, and blown up here, uh, scale by a factor of three. You can see photometry in the optical is, is quite doable. But as you go to the infrared, the H-band, where you get the advantages of dust, lower dust, 
the, the problem is that the red giants in the disk and the asymptotic giant branch stars that are even brighter are the, one of the stars that are crowding your Cepheids. And so the photometry, accurate photometry, is much more difficult. When you're in a high surface brightness region near the center of the galaxy, the dust uh, content has gone up, the crowding has gone up, the blending and uh, the chemical composition is higher. So all three of those effects are covariant and um, could, it, it may not uh, and ultimately, but we need to understand if, if this is uh, a systematic issue, it could be causing a systematic uncertainty. And I, I should just uh, mention that this is the second, uh, uh, one of the second brightest star that's used in the FIT uh, for the period of luminosity relation in Little Law. And it, the problem is only uh, worsened as we go to fainter and fainter stars. The photometry uh, gets much harder. So this is one of the reasons, you know, having worked on Cepheid for so long, uh, that I felt it was important to have a completely independent uh, calibration of the local distance scale. Uh, the only way we're going to understand if there are systematic effects in either method is to have independent measurements that will point the way to what, uh, you know, whether we have the systematics under control. And that, that was the philosophy of the key project, was to measure several different distance indicators beat down the statistical uncertainties by increasing the sample sizes, but only by combining several different results can you be confident that you have the systematics under control. And, and to within the uncertainties, the key project value has, has uh, remained um, valid. So that, that was the motivation for trying to uh, do the tip of the red giant branch and to try and get uh, as high accuracy as we could. Um, this really hadn't been looked at in, in a couple of decades since the key project. And the underlying uh, physical basis of the method is very simple. It's much simpler than it is for physics, uh, for, uh, for Cepheids, the physics of Cepheids. You have a degenerate helium core in these stars. They've exhausted the, the hydrogen uh, in their cores, but don't have sufficient temperature to ignite helium non, uh, in a uh, non-degenerate core. And, and so a hydrogen burning shell forms around the degenerate core and is in, uh, continuing to dump mass onto the, the helium core. And when the temperature reaches about 100 million degrees, is at a mass of about um, 0.47 solar masses, then um, helium ignition, the triple alpha process can take place. And it happens at almost constant core mass or a constant luminosity, which means that this is an extremely good and predictable standard candle. And then you lift the degeneracy, you get triple alpha process, and the star rearranges itself and settles down onto the uh, horizontal branch. And so uh, from an observational perspective, we go out and observe uh, this uh, NGC U185, a nearby dwarf spheroidal companion to Andromeda. Here's the horizontal branch, here's the red giant branch, the star is increasing in luminosity as the temperature is getting hotter and hotter. And then when the helium flash occurs, the stars disappear from this position in the uh, color magnitude diagram. The stars uh, end up on a horizontal branch, but it means that there's a very sh uh, sharp and definable and um, easily measured tip <laughs> to the red giant branch. And we uh, use effectively determine the first derivative of the luminosity function, it's an edge detector, um, that allows us to uh, quantitatively determine the position of the tip. And uh, in practice, what we do is inject small numbers of stars into the frames, artificial stars do the same process over and over, build up a sample of about a million stars so that we understand the uncertainties in measuring the position at the tip and it's quantifiable and reproducible and gives us a good measurement of the uncertainties. This now is uh, the fields in NGC 4258 where Cepheids have been discovered. So the negative image, the um, dust lines here are white, the stars are black, but you can see that the fields uh, where you necessarily find the Cepheids in the disk have uh, dust lanes running through them and some of them have um, quite uh, high surface brightness where it's difficult to measure um, the luminosities accurately. Just uh, to show you, these are the types of fields that we measure the tip of the red giant branch. We go out along the minor axis of the galaxy into the halo. And uh, in, in, in the contrast here where you see the disk, 
you, you can't even tell that there are TRGB stars here. But when you point Hubble and the advanced camera for surveys at this field, uh, you measure hundreds, uh, thousands, tens of thousands of uh, stars in the field. These are the red giant branch stars. And here are the asymptotic giant branch stars. They occur in a ratio of about one to four. And so the AGB stars provide a pedestal, uh, but we can still quite clearly measure, as we measure the first derivative in, in the luminosity function, where this peak uh, occurs and uh, determine the TRGB distance to the galaxy. So with Hubble, uh, we uh, obtained time to go out into the halos of uh, nine galaxies here in, in um, the nearby universe. Uh, that allowed us, there were also archival data for five additional galaxies, and some of them had multiple supernovae. So in the end, we ended up with 18 calibrators for the tip of the red giant branch method. And i uh, just showing you here again the um, color magnitude diagrams, the, uh, the um, red giant branches here, the luminosity functions, and then this filter edge response that is uh, very well determined in all of, of the cases. What we did do was uh, to have independent subgroups within the group do this measure do these measurements both of the calibration and also measurement of um, the photometry and luminosity function the artificial star tests and only compare the results at the end so that uh, it, we, we could do this in an effectively uh, partially blind at least uh, manner now here i'm showing the nearby galaxies in gray here a comparison of the cepheid and the tip of the red giant branch distances and you can see uh, here now is that uh, you can see the dispersion in the relation. The agreement is very good in the, uh, for the nearest galaxies. I'm going out to about 30 megaparsecs. The red galaxies are those uh, which have had type 1a supernovae in them. So these are the calibrators that uh, are useful for measuring the Hubble constant. So I'm blowing up now those uh, galaxies, 10 in common between the tip of the red giant branch and Cepheids. And, and you can see that scatter, um, in some cases, it exceeds the quoted uncertainties. Uh, we don't yet know where that difference lies, but uh, the scatter, not surprisingly, increases as you go to greater distances. It's just harder to make these measurements for any of um, these uh, uh, galaxies and, and methods. But one hint may come, the um, measurement of the Luminosity is a supernovae. This is the absolute magnitude of uh, the type 1a supernovae calibrated on the left with the tip of the red giant branch and on the right with Cepheids. And so the scatter for the TRDD calibration is uh, just over a tenth of a magnitude, which matches well with uh, the distant supernova sample that we use to go out into the Hubble flow, but it's larger for the Cepheid sample. So that may be a hint that there's, uh, um, there's some issue with the, the Cepheid distances relative to the tip of the red giant branch. There is now an independent test of um, our TRGB distances. I showed you the one test of the Cepheids that was done by an independent group for NBC 5584. Um, this is now a sample um, that's been measured um, by this is Tully, uh, Brent Tully and his group. Uh, so they independently analyzed the data, did the photometry, measured the, the tip of the red giant branch, and uh, there, there's just phenomenal agreement uh, amongst the, the two groups in these measurements. So these are very reproducible and there are many of them now. Uh, they agree to half a percent. So that's a completely independent measurement. And I'll just mention this is scaled to HD 4258, so they're all scaled to the same zero point. Um, that group uses a different zero point. They, they, they scale to the Cepheids. Um, that, that, that's the choice that they've made. Okay, so for type 1a supernovae, I'll just very briefly describe a project that we had going at, Su at uh, Carnegie for many years, making use of all the different size telescopes on the mountain, the Swope 1 meter, the DuPont 2.5 meter, and then the Magellan 6.5 meters. This is a project that Mark Phillips and I were co-PIs on, and uh, the idea was to get 
very good cadence, very good coverage of the supernovae, uh, both in time and also uh, uh, extremely good coverage in wavelength from the ultraviolet to the near infrared. It allowed us to uh, get very uh, well-determined uh, objects caught before maximum. We did a follow-up, I should say. This was not a search for Cepheids, for <laughs> supernovae. It was other groups uh, were finding them, but didn't have the time to do extensive follow-up. And that's what we took on. We also got extensive uh, spectroscopy for all of the supernovae. And as a function of phase, it allowed us to measure the K-corrections uh, really accurately. So it, it's the most extensive self-consistent data set for dealing with systematics. So we were interested in, in very accurate reddening, K-corrections to understand uh, the evolution of these objects. And uh, we uh, monitored the behavior of the detectors. We came back each year to make sure that the zero point wasn't floating. So it's a very nice uh, and extensive data set. Uh, it, not in terms of numbers, there are many more objects that have been observed, but in terms of attention to systematics. And this is the, the sample, the distant sample here shown in, in blue, and our uh, tip of the red giant branch calibrators. We use a program that was developed by Chris Burns at Carnegie and uh, fit the light curves, uh, use the light curve parameters that he fits as uh, inputs into a, a Markov chain Monte Carlo analysis, and then simultaneously solve, uh, for example, there's a, an empirical correlation between the peak luminosity of your supernova and the host galaxy mass. Um, and this is something people have been looking into very closely, but all groups are, are now finding this. It's, uh, and, and it uh, allows us to determine the Hubble constant and also a full covariance matrix. And this is what gave rise to the value that we uh, published in 2019, 69.8. Uh, we did a, a more detailed analysis of the distance to the LMC that we had used, um, but came uh, found the results were in very good agreement. So this is just uh, shy of a 3% measurement. Since that time, a uh, number of students, mainly uh, at the University of Chicago um, and a couple of postdocs, uh, ha we have been trying to test the to the bridge iron branch calibration. And so I'm going to speed up just in interest of time, but let me say that we now have four independent calibrators for uh, the to the bridge iron branch method. So we're no longer reliant simply on the large Magellanic cloud as we were in 2019. We've used a sample of globular clusters in the Milky Way, so the, this first case, clusters that have a wide range in metal abundance that uh, effectively covers the range that we're seeing in the halos of nearby galaxies. We fit to the horizontal branches of these clusters. The horizontal branches are completely independent of the, what's happening at the tip, but when we fit those, uh, we can then measure the tip. The statistics for individual clusters are not uh, good enough uh, in most cases to measure, um, there are too few uh, tip the red giant branch stars, but the composite allows us to get a very good measurement of the tip. And it agrees to within 1% at a fraction of a sigma level with what we found in 2019. And it's a completely independent method for doing the calibration. We also have looked at archival data for this uh, Mazar galaxy with the supermassive black hole the data in the archive, there are 15 fields that are in the halo away again from the disk, which um, is full of dust and um, star, active star formation and much more crowded. Um, the, the shoes group have analyzed data in the disk. Um, there are dust lanes that you can see at neutral hydrogen, and again, the crowding is higher. So we don't understand why you would make that measurement when there are clearly um, data with far fewer systematic um, issues in, in the halo. In any case, um, we, uh, In Sung Jang here is the lead author in this paper. He's measured the tip, looked as a function of position, and done a very detailed artificial star test. And uh, the calibration that we got um, for the large Magellanic cloud uh, here now in magnitudes, uh, it, it, this is agreeing to the four thousandths of a magnitude level. So um, in, a completely independent measurement 
um, the, the distance has been measured in a completely independent way. But the tip is remarkably stable, again, to better than a percent. And I just mentioned uh, graduate student Taylor Hoyt is about to come out with a paper. It will be published um, very, sh uh, put on the archive very shortly. And he's reanalyzed the data in the Large Magellanic Cloud. Uh, there's a new detached eclipsing binary now to the small Magellanic Cloud. And he's looked at uh, regions where there's uh, now new maps of the hydrogen uh, density, uh, hydrogen cold density in these two galaxies. Uh, and you can see how well measured the peaks are in both of these cases. And uh, the calibration, again, agrees extremely well to the level of uh, thousands or um, uh, hundredths of magnitude in, in one case with our earlier calibration. I'm not going to talk now about uh, some additional tests. These are done on the uh, dwarf sirotal sculptor and fornax and some globular clusters in the OMC. But again, uh, extremely good agreement with what we're finding in these other four calibrators now. I uh, won't say very much about the early uh, EDR3 results from Gaia, except to say that there's still a parallax uh, offset of 17 micro arc seconds. That's improved from the data release too, but there's an additional uh, uncertainty that people have um, found. Um, there's a, a, a variance with respect to the background quasars. Again, it's uh, people who have looked at this from the Gaia team and several other groups have looked at this, that there's, uh, in, this is in the case of um, Omega Centauri, the globular cluster, um, that there's a, a minimum systematic floor of an additional 10 micro arc seconds in, in the um, parallax measurement to this cluster. That's a 5% uncertainty at the distance of, of Omega Centauri. And it's very difficult to eliminate. Um, so there have been recent claims that you can do this to 1%, um, but that uh, I think most groups have concluded is a very optimistic look at the uncertainties. So putting it together, um, this is the paper that uh, is uh, going to be posted shortly. So I, I now I'm calibrating not simply with the LMC, but also using the Milky Way globular cluster as the maser distance to NGC 4258 and uh, tip of the red giant branch calibrated by detached eclipsing binaries to the SMC. And uh, in terms of supernovae, uh, excluding the fast decliners, the, the redder supernovae so that the distant and nearby samples of supernovae overlap well. Um, you end up with a value of 69.8, an excellent agreement with what we found earlier only with the LMC, and that's a 2.4% measurement. I just want to briefly uh, comment that, uh, so here is the, uh, these are the data for the uh, globular clusters that I showed you earlier, the composite. Uh, this is a value of 69.8. Uh, these are theoretical isochromes shown here. Um, but the claims in the literature recently that the Hubble constant is 74, in some cases people have been claiming as high as uh, 76. This, this is going to run into problems with stellar astrophysics, it's just not uh, the, the, the measurements for um, the, the position of the tip. Uh, now are, are making it extremely unlikely that these value, high values in the Hubble constant are, are going to stand up. Uh, this is just uh, now just showing you what the four calibrators give you for the TERGB. Uh, these are the Cepheid measurements uh, and a comparison of, of the two. Um, so the tip of the red giant branch is coming in about uh, 69.8, as I said, and the Cepheids um, somewhere around 73. I'm showing here uh, now uh, you may have seen uh, some of you uh, plots that are being shown that uh, not plots, just um, lists of the CMB on the left hand side and then the, um, the Cepheids and other methods on the right hand side that shows overwhelming uh, uh, evidence for a high value of the Hubble constant. But I think it's important to make a distinction where the uncertainties now uh, are smaller, where there are either larger numbers of objects, you know, there are 19 calibrators for the Cepheids, there are now 19 for the tip of the red gyre branch. Many of these others have only one. Uh, these are the published quoted uncertainties for these other methods um, that have been uh, published so far. 
and um, at least so far, uh, they, they just are not rivaling in accuracy what is achievable with the Tim Red Giant Branch or Cepheids. So I think uh, I'll just um, start to wrap up by saying uh, I, I'm very enthusiastic about what's going to happen in the next few years. I think we really will get to the bottom of these uncertainties. The um, Geyer results, uh, we still have this offset and then the uh, additional RMS uncertainty in any given region of the sky. But with the fourth and fifth data releases, uh, the, the uh, hope at least of the Gaia team is zero point for Cepheids and to the giant branch and other distance indicators will will be below the percent level. We can improve the LMC calibration going directly to space, and then uh, James Webb I I think is uh, going to be really key here. Uh, and I'm very excited about the fact we just got time to uh, measure not just the tip of the red giant branch, but also Cepheids and a new method that we've been developing using carbon stars that uh, will allow us to we make measurements with higher resolution. Uh, we are also looking at this chemical composition issue. We have filters that will allow us to uh, distinguish and, and constrain the metallicity effect. And uh, the giants themselves are very red. So the uh, JWST, which is sensitive in the red, will allow us to go out to a much larger volume and increase the statistical precision as well as the systematic. Um, the accuracy of the results. So that launch date is uh, October of 2021. I heard a recent talk by uh, the um, chief scientist at NASA on that. That date appears to be holding steady. We we're hoping that that will, will happen. So I will uh, end by saying uh, the tip of the red giant branch results are supporting the standard lambda CDM model. They don't require new physics. I think there still remains uh, the possibility, which would be very exciting, that there could be physics beyond the standard model, um, and that's uh, coming from the Cepheid data. Um, so our early results with lower um, uh, significance, but also our 2012 Spitzer results gave a higher value, and those of the SHOES team, and some evidence, as I've shown you, from less accurate methods. But I think it's important to realize there are systematic errors clearly that are affecting the local distance scale at the two to three percent level. Um, we don't understand yet where the, what those are or how they will be resolved in favor of the tip of the red giant branch or the Cepheids. But as I've shown you, I think the, um, uh, the onus is on us to improve the accuracy and the Cepheid distance scale before we can uh, claim that there is a significant, as in fundamental physics, significant tension. So I think this is going to take a few more years, but it's entirely feasible, I think, uh, given what is coming on the horizon and, um, and then in the longer term with other techniques like uh, LIGO and uh, gravitational wave silence. So I will end here, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Wendy. Thank you for such a, um, a great talk, really, summarizing the entire uh, different methods and tension and uh, it has uh, triggered a few questions here. I'm going to uh, go through them. Uh, here, starting with uh, this question from uh, Marco Laversvele, who is a, uh, he's a student at Valongo, and he asks, what is the approximated uh, maximum distance at which it is still possible to define the RGB see the halo and, and use the tip of the red giant branch uh, method? And how is this comparable with other uh, methods? Yeah, it's, so at the moment, the, the limit is about 30 megaparsecs. Um, in our proposal to JWST, my strong preference was to, to uh, keep us at uh, 20 megaparsecs or so, so that we could be absolutely certain that we had exquisite photometry. Um, I think with JWST, it's going to be possible to go to at least 40 megaparsecs, ultimately. And um, in their... Uh, plans on there, and, 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 and I haven't talked at all about just because of um, issues of time, but we've been developing a method with carbon stars in the J band, and uh, these are much brighter, and uh, th th I think it would be possible to go out to coma, 100 megaparsecs using that technique. So I, I think, uh, again, in the next few years, uh, we'll be able to take the uh, some of the distance indicators that we use locally now and bypass or at least have a, an independent measurement out to the where, where we're observing a type 1a supernovae now. 
So we have uh, uh, here uh, Elio uh, Jacques Rochapita, is a professor at Valongo. He's also the director of the institute. He's asking, uh, with respect to the uh, tip of the red giant branch uh, method, how how do we deal with the metallicity? How to deal with the metallicity of the galaxy? At least the RGB feature in a CMD uh, depends on the, the metallicity. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I didn't uh, have have the time to go into that. And, and, and one of the really nice things about the um, tip of the red giant branch mm -hmm. is that the um, in, in the color magnitude diagram, the, the color of the star tracks um, with metallicity. And so the isochrones that I showed you, um, the um, and I at one point showed the globular clusters and the different um, metallicity ranges, um, so, so the blue stars um, have low metallicity and the red stars have high metallicity. Empirically, um, and I'm sorry, I don't have it, um, the slide, uh, I don't think I have, maybe I do have it below. I'm oh, sorry. Um, I used to have it in my, um, no, so, whoops, now I've lost you. Can you still hear me? Uh, yes, yes, we can. Uh, okay. Um, the, um, the interesting thing about the um, wavelength dependence is that the I band turns out to be the crossover between, if you observe at um, optical wavelengths, the, the tip of the red giant branch slants downward because um, the metallicity is, the opacity in the atmospheres are causing stars to be fainter with higher metallicity. That um, uh, luminosity gets redistributed as you go to the infrared. So the, the stars get brighter in the, in the near infrared. But the I band is the crossover. So the bullimetric correction is constant. And, and the, the, as you could see empirically, the, the relation is very flat, or the color magnitude diagram, the tip is very flat. And um, the study that I mentioned by Taylor Hoyt, which will soon be posted, um, it, it shows again exquisitely over a wide range in metallicity uh, over which we're observing. It's it's very flat, and so um, we uh, we've been very careful to stay to the blue part of the um, of the color magnitude diagram because you know every um, galaxy, of course, has a first generation of stars, metal, poor, blue giants uh, in their halos. So even if there is a metallicity range, and uh, the only galaxy that we really see that in um, is uh, uh, NGC 4258, and, uh, and, and all of the halo galaxies that we looked at turned out to be very, very flat. But we, could, we can see that empirically. We know when metallicity is affecting us. And the difficulty with um, Cepheids is that one, there, so there is no, we have no way of knowing what the metallicity of an individual Cepheid is. And uh, so, so this was something we developed before the key project was a way of essentially measuring a proxy using the um, H2 region abundances, oxygen to hydrogen abundances for H2 regions um, at, at you know, the same radial distance as the Cepheids. And, and this was something Barry Maduro and I had developed about 30 years ago. And you know, we, we used it just as a test. It never occurred to us that this was going to be the method that allowed you to correct for metallicity for the Cepheids 30 years later. And the literature on the subject, you know, people disagree on the slope. You know, it's either zero or it's minus 0.6 um, magnitudes per dex. And it, you know, it's a parameter that goes into the fit of the shoes um, uh, analysis. Um, but as I said, if you get your luminosities wrong because of blending, um, then, then your metallicities are going to be off. And so um, I don't know how, and as I said, so what we're trying to do with JWST is we've got a filter that will allow us to, to um, measure the overall metallicity directly for the individual Cepheids. And I'm hoping we can uh, shed some light on that issue. But it's a much easier um, issue because for the tip of the red giant branch because we can see directly are these metal poor or are these metal rich um, just by measuring uh, a, col a, a color for the, for the stars. Did I lose you? Uh-oh. I 
I'm sorry. I was oh. muted. No, that's okay because I can't see anything. So I just a I'm sorry. Me. Yes, yes. So, uh, so uh, the next question. I'm sorry. I, I forgot that I was muted, and I and I know that you cannot see us. Um, I so it's from from Chago, uh, also a professor here. You you know him. Uh, as he said, excellent talk. Uh, thank you very much. Sorry if I must misunderstood, but the H not greater than 70 results for cephids would then be the result of systematics. Do you expect better results for supernovae with the Vera Rubin? Um, so I heard everything up to the, could the cephids be systematic and what was the part about the supernovae? Do you, do you expect a better results for the supernovae with the Vera Rubin, with the LSST? Um, so, so okay, so the, you understood correctly that um, that the Cepheid calibrated distance scale could potentially contain systematics that could explain the tension, uh, but at the moment there are no, I mean, there, there's no direct evidence that that's an issue. What we see is some difference with the tip of the red giant branch, which is the first external check on the Cepheids, and there's a difference, and so. The, uh, you know, I think what we have to keep in mind is the difference between the TRGB distances and the Cepheid distances is that has to be systematics. That's not fundamental early universe physics, right? We need to understand that difference before we can claim that there's early universe physics. And, and potentially, yes, it, it could be systematics in the Cepheids, it could be systematics in, in the tip of the red giant branch. But the simplicity of the TRGB and the really good agreement now amongst these four different calibrations has given me more confidence that the TRGB is less susceptible uh, to systematics. They're out in the halo, the dust is negligible, the metallicity, uh, you know, we, we, we can see directly what the effects of metallicity are. Um, the physics is simple, you know, this is a, a the triple alpha process has been studied theoretically for decades. Um, the models agree with the empirical measurements um, for, for example, globular clusters. And, and so the, the cepheids that you're pulsating, we don't know the metallicity effect, they, they reside in the disk where crowding is high, dust is high, etc. just are more prone to potential systematic effects. And you know, I've worked on both and I, I love cepheids, as you saw, uh, the nearby cepheids agree really well. It's only when you push them, I think, in my view, push them beyond where you can keep control of systematics at the level of one or two percent, which is what what is now being claimed. That I think we're running into trouble. Um, the supernovae with Rubin, so you have to calibrate the supernovae. Supernovae give you relative distances only. And so you have to have a zero point that's going to come either from to the red giant branch or cepheids, um, maybe then carbon stars, as I mentioned earlier, I, I think is uh, turning into a very promising technique. So you'll get more supernovae, but we're not at the point where statistics are the issue, right? We've got enough supernovae that uh, the statistical errors are small. It's the systematics that we need to understand. Now, could there be systematics in the supernovae? Yes, and I think, uh, you know, the, um, the issue about what the luminosity mass of the galaxy relation is, is, you know, one place where I think we don't have that um, completely um, constrained at a level that would be helpful in this tension. So we, we know that the luminosity of the supernova is not being controlled by the mass of the galaxy where the supernova is living, right? It's something local maybe metallicity or you know, some other effect that we don't understand. But the luminosities of supernovae uh, are, are different depending on whether you're in an elliptical or a spiral galaxy. And that, that I, I didn't mention yet, uh, the tip of the red giant branch has the advantage that you can find the, the red giant branch stars in ellipticals and spirals. And so uh, we have less of a dependence on this mass effect. And the, the, the cepheids will always be confined to spirals because ellipticals are not forming stars. They don't have cepheids. So that, that's another advantage of the, the tip of the red giant branch. So I, I don't think Rubin is going to be the decisive factor in the H naught tension simply because uh, statistics are not um, what the issue is. It's, it's systematics. Um, I think here I bring a, a common question from Julio Gonzalez, uh, uh, pertinent to the discussion right now. Is it thank you for the seminar? 
uh, would be possible to take the other way around about the H0 tension and assume that the H0 value at the RV universe is correct and the change in physics is actually happening in supernovae uh, mechanisms. So it was the first part of that, would that be fair to do? Is that what mm -hmm. the question? Mm -hmm. Instead of thinking of, of new early early universe uh, physics, if, if there's pondering, there's reflection along the lines of uh, new physics on the supernovae. Uh, yeah, so I, I think in the same way, certainly that would be fair, as fair as considering early universe physics, but you also have to keep in mind what the systematics are at the moment and be careful about what you would then say about the supernovae, right? If you attribute it to the supernovae, because there are systematics along the way that also could be, you know, have nothing to do with the supernovae. But but I, I think it's just a fair point, right? If you're gonna consider new physics in the early universe, then considering new physics in, in supernovae is a reasonable thing to consider, yeah. Uh, you mentioned right at the end, uh, bringing here uh, the gravitational waves. Uh, there's another question I hear from Chago, uh, saying, "Can we can we expect uh, gravitational wave measurements to rival the position of other methods? Maybe with Lisa." You mentioned it right at the end. Uh, gravitational yeah. Waves. My my hope right. is that yes, that will be possible. I think you know when the first uh, gravitational wave siren was discovered, the you know 17 whatever the telephone number of that object is, was discovered. I mean, it was so bright and so, you know, right after LIGO, you know, effectively could discover it, that there was a lot of optimism that there were going to be many more of these objects quickly. And there were estimates made that, you know, within two years, you were going to have a Hubble constant to, I don't know, 2%. It was really, really optimistic prediction. And then there have been none since then of that, uh, uh, luminosity nearby that it, it was really nearby and um, and so uh, it, I hope you know clearly there are more of them out there we didn't discover the only one in the universe um, but it's going to be slow uh, it appears before a statistically significant sample shows up so uh, you know I, I hope within a decade there are at least several and um, you know, longer time scale than that, it will just get better and better as, as more objects are, are discovered. And I do think it's going to be important because there are systematics that affect, in principle, you know, in practice, the only way we'll learn, again, is to have external comparisons for things that don't rely on the local distance scale. For example, we both assume um, that the the extinction law is universal and we know within the galaxy at different lines of sight that the the ratio of total to selective to selective absorption varies along different lines of sight so you hope on average that it's it's you know going to be okay but um like the calibration of the reddening maps and um now it affects the the trgb and the cepheids in different ways because for the cepheids um very commonly and for the shoes team and for the key project and and other studies most people use uh, the the Vezin height uh, function which is a reddening free magnitude so you you use the the coefficient which is the uh, ratio of total to selective absorption to, to form a reddening free magnitude um, and uh, for for the tip of the red giant branch you're out in the halo where the reddening is negligible and so the, the effects of dust are different but it, it, just to make the point that we're using astrophysical objects and um, you know, each of those potentially has effects that would make it hard to me measure, say for example, less than 1% um, distances. And so how will you determine if there are you know, overall systematics that could be affected? Because we have calibrators in common too, right? We're using the LMC and NGC 4258, those distances if those have systematics in them. Now, the estimated uncertainties in all these things that I've been talking about are, are relatively small. They're one or 2% effects that people are at least estimating what the systematics are. But again, I think uh, you know two methods is not enough. You're gonna want a, a third external method. And I, I'm hopeful that it, it will be something like the gravitational wave sirens that have nothing in common uh, in terms of their own systematics. But unfortunately, they're rare.
Are you muted again? I'm trying not to pollute your talk with like dogs barking and things like that, and then I forget. Yeah, no, I just don't myself. Know I'm sorry. <laughs> so no. I think it's a, it's a it's a good way of uh, finishing here with this uh, question. So this is uh, Yana Martin. She's a PhD student. Alba Longo, she said, a really nice presentation, Dr. Freeman. Thank you. But today my question is not about science itself. Uh, can you tell us about your experience as a head department, PI of many missions and research groups and being a woman? Did you face some struggles about it? Oh, no, it was all trivial, easy, never. <laughs> 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 I can't imagine why you asked the question. <laughs> um, there, there are... Um, I mean, there are many women listening to this, so it's 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 good also to take a to take a a moment to to discuss these things and see and, and ponder about these things. But yeah, yeah, super easy. <laughs> so I think you know I feel really fortunate to have come along at the time that I did. I think the the women um, you know who came before me, like uh, Vera Rubin and Margaret Burbage, and and, um, and others really um, faced barriers that were um, much worse than I faced and, and, and more women were just starting to come in, into the field. Um, so so I, I feel very lucky at that and, 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 I, and I think also just the, the timing for me, I had was just finishing up my thesis and the last part of my thesis was on Cepheid variables. And then the, it was planning for the Hubble Space Telescope. It was supposed to be launched in 1986. Um, and then it was delayed. And, and so um, by the time that it flew, you know, I had published a lot on Cepheid variables. And, and, and so for me to become involved in what became the key project and then eventually, you know, leading the science effort in the key project, that's timing and, and you know luck, um, and and I think um, you know of course this is a longer conversation and there are many aspects <laughs> to it, um, but I, I, you know I, I joined an environment where you know, the observatories at Carnegie had never hired a woman onto its permanent staff. Um, and in the 1970s, even Carnegie Fellows, postdoctoral fellows, uh, if, if a woman applied, uh, the director of the observatory at that time sent a letter saying, thank you very much, but we don't accept applications for women, which is partly why I say I feel lucky that I came along at the time that I did, because you know, they took my application and, um, and then they hired me. And, and so... Um, and, and then I happened to be working on something that essentially the Hubble Space Telescope had been built to, to resolve the, the factor of two debate. Um, I, I think, um, you know, when I became director, well, I guess even before that, so, you know, when I had uh, young children, when I, when I got pregnant, the business manager at the observatory came into my office of the form and said, if you don't return to work and in six weeks, uh, you'll lose your job. And so, you know, there was no uh, policy that uh, allowed for, um, you know, maternity leave or paternity leave at that time. They never hired a woman, so they, you know, they didn't have to think about it. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, those were things as director I could do something about many years later, and I could, you know, from the other side do things that would um, make it easier for a younger generation of, of women. But, um, you know, I feel fortunate. You know, there are other things that happened in my career and, you know, with people in my career that weren't pleasant and, you know, a topic for probably uh, a drink, not a, a colloquium. Those things are real and they're unpleasant at the time and, um, you know, can be very difficult. But, but I would say that overall, um, you know, what has really for me been, I think most important is I love what I do. I, um, and I feel lucky to have had a career in science and, and to have come along at a time when it's possible. Now, are there things that need to change still? Yes. Um, 
you know, occasionally I hear things from young women and I, I just can't believe that uh, in this day and age that um, people have to face some of the things that they're facing. But I do think that overall things have gotten better, which is not to say there's not room for improvement. Um, but um, uh, I, I look back, you know, at earlier times when women didn't, you know, I, even in the history of the distance scale and, and um, you know, the Cepheid Levitt Law, which you notice I refer to as the Levitt Law, and, and um, at a meeting at Harvard in 2008, we, we um, suggested that we name the period luminosity relation after her. I mean, she wasn't allowed to get a degree at Harvard. Women weren't accepted at that time. And, um, and yet everything in cosmology to this day depends on her having discovered uh, the Levitt Law, the Hubble Law. Um, and so, um, yeah, um, I hope someday I can visit and we can have a further conversation. But yeah. <laughs> does that answer your question? <laughs> I think it does. Thank you very much. I mean, I know it's a longer conversation. It's just good to put it on the, on the, the, the um, as part of the conversation, basically, just bring that that subject. And I think it's. Uh, I I was a postdoc at Carnegie for for three years, and um, it was. I mean, the environment was pretty amazing, and I, I could I could see from, from, up close. So you're a very busy woman. So I it was it was just very good to. To share that time uh, in there. So I think it's really good to bring that part of the conversation. But I mean, the talk was spectacular. So thank you very much. Thank you on behalf of um, of everyone, and uh, thank you for all the all of you who were here present. And yes, uh, come back for next week for for our next uh, our next talk. And yeah, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Wendy. And stay here. We can we can continue talking a little bit more. Uh, okay. So. Yeah, thanks to everyone who accompanied the seminar. I'm sorry I can't see anybody, but thank you for, <laughs> for listening. <laughs>